Hi, everyone. This is Alex Mitchell. The topic that I'm talking about today is product and growth and how these two teams, often these two individuals uh, and the other people they work with, are honestly so much better together. So let's start with the ways that these two groups can really support each other. So one of the first ways that I found as a person over in product who works often with, with growth folks that, that I can you know, be greatly supported is getting these growth experiments uh, and getting the data from those growth experiments and doing what I'm calling data-driven roadmap additions. So anyone who's been in product management knows, you know, as you're adding things to the roadmap, you have different levels of confidence around those items you're adding. Um, you know, some may be very, you know, kind of heavily justified with in-product data. You know that, you know, X amount of percent of people are likely to use this feature. It's been asked for by a certain percent of people. You know, maybe even what the, the pricing sensitivity is on it. You, you have a lot of information. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you might have items on your product roadmap that are not very validated, right? They're, they're intuition. They're based on where the industry is going. They're based on where you guys think there's an opportunity. And so what growth can provide is a way to add additional data to those, those items that you're maybe a little bit less certain about. And so it's great to lean on your growth team, challenge them with this problem you have, and see what experiments they can put out there into the real world to get you rapid feedback on those items. Another one is, is for product to actually go the other way and unlock growth testing opportunities. So growth teams, growth marketers will have their own ideas, right, about different you know, areas of, of potential opportunity inside of the product, inside of the market that you guys are operating in. And products, you know, having kind of the, the control and access to, to engineering um, can help growth test on those opportunities. You know, it's great if growth can test without any development resources, but often, you know, maybe they'll get zero to one um, on that, but maybe if you go from one to 10 or 10 to 100, they'll need some resources from the product and engineering team. And so it's really, you know, kind of the, the goal and the necessity of product to build along with engineering, what I call that small features that are just real enough. More importantly, uh, product also should think, along with engineering, what's the way that we can make this product that we're building for our growth team more of a platform for testing? So that it's not only going to serve this one tiny testing need that the growth team has, but it'll give them some levers, some knobs to, to turn or pull so that they can you know, get maybe 10 tests out of this, 20 tests out of this in short order. Essentially, you're trying to build something quick, just real enough with a lot of levers and knobs for your growth team and really generate something that can unlock dozens of tests for that team. So support each other by product kind of unlocking these high value, high leverage growth testing opportunities. Product and growth work closely together at, at a lot of companies, um, but it's important to, to have a little bit of structure around the way these teams work together. And so in your product manager and in your growth marketer, you have probably two of the most creative, um, fast thinking, idea generating people at your company. Um, so it's important that these teams come together often uh, to brainstorm ideas, right? So in some of the companies I've worked at, this can be a weekly meeting where growth hosts the meeting. They share the output of some of the tests from that past week. They share some of their concepts for testing in the next week. And they invite other ideas from products. They invite um, you know, product to share what's coming on the roadmap so that you can kind of get this idea explosion um, together by bringing product and growth into the same room. Um, one word of caution here, that idea explosion, you know, it's a blessing and a curse to bring together two of the most creative people or two of the most creative idea generating teams. Um, so it's usually important to focus on a specific piece of the funnel. 
Another way to support each other is sharing ownership of the funnel. So I, you know, have been talking about this, you know, AARRR popular funnel without actually naming it out here with Pirate Metrics, um, you know, in my my talk so far. But it's really important that you define ownership and you sometimes share it with the growth teams. That growth and product understand what they're responsible for. They understand what areas they're working in, and also importantly, they understand the metrics that matter at each stage. In short. Product and growth need to be on the same page with the funnel, the metrics, the performance. And again, that weekly check-in with growth and product is a great place to review those metrics. So you want this to be visible. You want to be communicating in the same language to each other. And you want to be very, very clear about who's working where and who owns what. Um, I've seen many times across different companies I've been at some confusion um, over ownership. So make sure you're communicating, make sure you are on the same page here. Another way that that growth can really support product, and, and this is something I've absolutely loved in some of the companies I've worked for, is growth can just so rapidly collect and, and share customer feedback, right? They're running so many experiments. They're creating what I call the fire hose of feedback. So make sure that that fire hose gets pointed, or at least the insights from that fire hose sometimes get pointed back to the product team. Um, this, in my mind, is one of the most valuable creations of the growth marketing team is this rapid feedback of qualitative, quantitative nature um, that products can just make better decisions, better roadmaps, better um, you know, planning um, decisions around. So you know, rapidly gathering that feedback is so valuable. You've got to make sure that it's shared, it's discussed, um, and that insights are, are gathered from it as well as both the product and growth team. So I've also mentioned these kind of growth step functions. And so there's these step functions that a growth team goes through when they're coming up with new hypotheses um, and testing them. So you know, you start at zero, of course, and going from zero to one, it's very manual. You're just trying to see, honestly, if there's something there, uh, if there's some potential uh, in, in the idea, if it's even worth talking about more or working on more. Uh, usually that happens without product. As you go the next step, one to 10, sometimes product and engineering get involved. At least product gets involved from my you know, brainstorming perspective, trying to help refine that growth test learn from it. Um, But growth is very self-sufficient in kind of those first two stages, typically. As they go 10 to 100, this is where engineering and product become involved to actually build out that feature, that just real enough feature that maybe is a platform that can be tested on, that can be improved on, and work its way towards that optimization mode. And so, again, communication is incredibly important here between product and growth. Um, I've even seen, you know, kind of growth teams share which ideas are in which stage and then what's going to either advance it to the next stage or kill that idea and that being distributed that being discussed with product and other stakeholders so communication about step functions of growth very important so you both know what things are becoming more real what are we learning what is getting close to that productization, um, you know, engineering resources stage, and what things are getting killed and, and why. So important to kind of follow these step functions and understand what is happening in each of them in every, any given week between your product and, and growth teams. So those are all the things you should do. Um, but here are some of the anti-patterns, as I call them, for product and growth. And these are all based on real experience. These are all things I've seen happen that that really harm the relationship between product and growth. So the first one, right, the opposite of of what we were just talking about there is this failure to share learnings or feedback. And so growth teams and product teams are often moving so quick and they have so many things to do and they're trying to communicate, you know, maybe to all of their stakeholders, but they might not be talking with each other. You know, a test failed, eh, you know, that test failed, let's move on. Let's not waste time sharing it with others bad decision. Um, these you know, failures to share learnings and feedback, they might not hurt you know, one time or two times, but it adds up. Eventually, the product team will start make, making suboptimal choices. I've even seen the case where you know, tests are run multiple times because it wasn't socialized before the results of a test. So sometimes you just waste tests. And ultimately, you slow the growth of a company because you're not learning um, you know, what's coming out of these tests, good, bad, or neutral. That information needs to be shared. It needs to be understood because it impacts 
the product roadmap. It impacts the direction of the organization. It impacts you know pretty much everything. And so make sure those learnings and feedback are shared. Another anti-pattern is you know failing to actually test you know product ideas. And I've I've been guilty of this. You have such a strong product intuition. You think you know this new feature is is going to be you know well received by everyone. Um, but you know, devil's in the details with any new feature. There are so many pieces of that feature often that that you know you're kind of taking guesses on, and they might be educated guesses. But why not take advantage of this growth team you have to test some of those aspects of the the idea to really help you confirm, you know, not only that the feature is worth building or not, but what degree, you know, do you need to build? What is that, you know, minimum viable product to use an overused term? But where is the the sensitivity there? What are the sub features that actually matter and that get people excited and and retained or you know activated? And what are the ones that you know, are a little bit more distant, maybe not as as valuable. So leverage your growth team. Let them help you shape how this feature develops. And most importantly, let them help you not waste your developers' precious, precious time um, by building you know the right thing the first time and giving yourself more of a chance of that by pre-validating some of the roadmap. Another anti-pattern is on the growth side. So you know sometimes when you're doing you know pricing tests, especially, there's a nature of of kind of overcomplicating the test. You know, we're going to introduce all these different tiers. We're going to change 37 different variables. It's going to take you know three four weeks to run because we need enough buyers to come through. While every now and then you may need you know a test that is a little bit longer duration or one that is a little bit more complex. Try and avoid these. Um, slow tests simply prevent you from learning other things, right? They eat up your testing capacity, they eat up your mental capacity. And honestly, complicated tests mean complicated results. It's going to be harder to sort through. It's not going to be as easy to explain. Um, you might end up more likely with a test result that that is, you know, up in one way, down in another. That's not super helpful. And honestly, at, at most stages of, of company growth, time is everything. So you need quick tests, you need simple tests as as much as possible, and product and growth through that brainstorm phase can collaborate on ways to make those tests quicker, to make them simpler. Incredibly important to not overcomplicate your testing. Another one that I've I've certainly seen before is playing the blame game. So, you know, product growth, especially at earlier stage startups, you're going to be trying so many different things. Tests are going to fail more often than they're going to succeed, um, and it's really important as the product and growth teams, you know, challenge each other during those those brainstorming stages. Challenge each other on the metrics that matter and how how to move those metrics. But don't play the blame game when tests fail. They're going to fail more often than they succeed. Uh, and honestly, a big fail in a test is actually a great learning. Um, I always say neutral is the worst result for testing. So if you have a big fail. You can learn a lot from that, and you can often try the complete opposite thing of what failed to see if you can get a win out of it. Um, so startups, you know, it's it's a silly expression, but it's a, a team sport, right? You you need to challenge each other, but you're going sort towards the same goal. You're going towards the same objective. So be on on the same page and really support each other. Don't play the blame game. Learn from tests. Celebrate failures. Uh, you can you can definitely uh, gain a win out of a fail. Uh, pretty quickly if you kind of approach it the right way. And one of the last ones here is about those funnel stages. So it's definitely an anti-pattern to get overly focused on one stage of of the development life cycle um, or the activation funnel. Don't neglect the different stages. You know, if you've only been testing in the activation stage or the awareness stage for a quarter, take a look at at retention, take a look at referral, um, take a look at revenue. You probably are missing some low-hanging fruit um, in these kind of down funnel stages that product can help support growth in. You may find those easier wins. And honestly, just keep the goals of your startup or your business in mind. Um, those goals will shift. You know, As a startup matures, they might care more about revenue instead of just activation. Um, they might care more about you know, referrals in, you know, to lower the the acquisition costs of new users. So pay attention to those as a product or growth person and make sure you're spending the proportionate amount of time with your testing and with your development in the right uh, funnel stage. 